Hi there everybody and welcome back to my channel. In this video tutorial, I'm going to give you a general overview of the topics of entropy, entropy change and Gibbs free energy change as outlined in the OCRA specification for A-level chemistry. Before we get started, I would really appreciate it if you would give this video a like as it lets YouTube know that I still exist. You may even wish to subscribe so that you can then stay updated. So before we look at Gibbs free energy and entropy change, let's actually start with a definition of entropy. For entropy, we use the symbol of a capital S, and we define entropy as a measure of the dispersal of energy in a system, which is greater the more disordered a system. Entropy is essentially a measure of how random a system is. It can tell you about that scale of disorder. Let's go right back to GCSE science and physical state. That's a good place to start with entropy. Generally, we see that gases have much higher entropy values than liquids, and then liquids have got higher entropy values than solids. However, there is then some overlap between solids and some liquids. Most entropy values as well are positive numbers, but you can get some rare negative entropy values, although I've never seen these come up on a chemistry exam. Sticking with our early GCSE here about a particle model, we remember that gases are very random and very disordered. Therefore, we see that gases have a high dispersal of energy in their systems, and then they can showcase this with their high entropy values. We also remember from early GCSE science in our particle model that solids have highly ordered systems with minimum disorder of their particles. Therefore, solids have got low entropy values. So we have a general pattern. Solids typically have less entropy than liquids, and liquids have got far less entropy than gases. I like to think of gases are king when it comes to entropy, and we can learn a lot about the entropy change of a reaction just by looking at gases in a reaction equation. Now, entropy changes, we actually need to be able to predict these as part of our A-level. And we can often use the physical states of our reactants and products to help us make these predictions. An entropy change can be positive or negative, just like an enthalpy change. But this time, we're not going to use the terms exothermic and endothermic. If a reaction equation shows a change to more gases or more liquids, then we can predict a positive entropy change for that reaction. We could also predict a negative entropy change if we saw liquids, for example, change to solids, for instance. We can also use the reaction stoichiometry to help predict the sign of an entropy change. For example, a reduction in the number of gaseous moles would suggest a negative entropy change for a chemical reaction. We also see a regular crossover in exam questions with the enthalpy of solution work. Now, in these reactions, we see a solid ionic lattice dissolving in water, which creates an aqueous solution. This kind of reaction is going to have a positive entropy change. You also need to be able to calculate the entropy change for a chemical reaction using the expression delta S equals entropy of the products minus entropy of the reactants. A good way to remember this is that your entropy change calculation is super. So that's entropy S equals products minus reactants. Don't forget that even though most of your entropy values are going to be positive numbers, there are some negative ones out there, but entropy changes can be positive or negative. The units of entropy and entropy change are joules per Kelvin per mole. Don't forget that joules bit, because it's going to be very important later with the free energy change calculation. We use entropy in something called the Gibbs equation. 
The Gibbs equation is used to determine the feasibility of a reaction, whether the reaction is feasible or not. Now, we've not used that term before. A feasible reaction is one that once started will carry on to completion without any energy being supplied to it. The feasibility of a process depends upon the entropy change and the temperature of the system, so we use the term T delta S for that, and the enthalpy change of the system, which you should recognize as delta H. So we have the Gibbs equation, which is delta G, the free energy change, equals delta H minus T delta S. And we can determine from our answer for delta G if a reaction is feasible or not when delta G has a negative value. We can also say a reaction is going to be feasible when delta G equals zero. So we're really looking for when delta G is less than or equal to zero. And when delta G does equal zero, the temperature that we've got that system under is actually going to be the temperature at which the feasibility changes. Because if you tweak that temperature and change the delta G to a positive value, the reaction is no longer feasible at that temperature. Keep an eye on your units that are used in the free energy equation. You'll notice that entropy change that's used in delta H minus T delta S is actually in kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. So any previous joules per Kelvin per mole values that you've used will need divided by a thousand. Temperature is Kelvin and delta H is kilojoules per mole as normal. We can also compare two different delta G values together. Let's say if we adjusted the temperature, we could tweak our value of delta G and make it more negative. If a value of delta G becomes more negative, then our reaction is actually becoming more feasible at that new temperature. And likewise, the reverse is true. If you cause for a value to get closer to zero from a negative figure for our delta G, then you're actually making the reaction less feasible by adjusting the temperature. So we've just learned that using the Gibbs equation, we can determine whether a process is feasible or not. When delta G is less than or equal to zero, our reaction is feasible, and a positive delta G means our reaction is not feasible. Now it could be down to the temperature, and so sometimes if we raise or lower the temperature, we can change the feasibility of the reaction. So. If we set delta G equal to zero, which is the minimum requirement for a reaction to be feasible, then rearrange our Gibbs equation as a subject of temperature, giving us delta H divided by delta S, then this is the temperature at which the feasibility of the reaction changes, and it's a very common exam question. Make sure you show that delta G equals zero in your answers. The temperature here will come out in Kelvin, but only if you use the correct units for delta H and delta S. Delta H is kilojoules per mole, and delta S must be kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. So any joules per Kelvin per mole delta S values that you've got will need dividing by a thousand first. The final thing I want to mention is about the limitations of predictions made by delta G about feasibility in terms of the reaction kinetics. Just because you calculate a negative delta G value doesn't actually mean a reaction will happen, or it doesn't tell you anything, I suppose, about its rate. The activation energy for the reaction could still end up being very, very large, so the reaction might be happening so slowly that you don't even notice it occurring. This is something really important to consider, and it is mentioned right at the end of the free energy section of the OCRA specification. And that's it. I really hope you found this video helpful, and if you did, I'd appreciate it if you could give this video a big thumbs up and consider subscribing so that you can stay updated for any future Module 5 videos that I upload to the channel. Until next time, though, Happy revising.